class today. So this is our last video of the semester. It's um, our second hour of class, but it's our third video. So we want to start to build an API. So I, in the previous hour, previous part of class, I actually described some real world scenarios of when we would use APIs in an e-commerce uh, scenario. So for example, so I built the number of APIs. So if somebody else is going to, some other website is going to take orders for us, and then we need an AP, we need to build an API. So those orders can get sent to us automatically without data entry. Or maybe we want to send orders out that come in. We want to send those out to a manufacturer. That'd be another API we could build. Um, other useful APIs would be to allow, for example, uh, the manufacturers to add new products into the catalog without us necessarily giving them backend access to our website. Um, doing shipping and tracking would be another API integration where um, our manufacturers, they ship out a batch of products so we could build an API that would allow them to automatically attach a tracking number to an order number. And then we might make an outbound API call uh, to a shipping company when a user clicks on their tracking number, a customer and they wanna see their order. So many kind of enterprise level web applications, there's a core application, and then we have a whole series of APIs for conducting business, for you know, doing different transactions. So it's important we not only know how to consume other APIs like we've already done with Google and Microsoft and Stripe, but we may need to build APIs to extend the functionality and allow other partners to integrate and talk to our app. So I wanna open up our .NET Duds project. Let's get it running. So you're going to open my project. I will start it up without debugging. And we'll create two different API controllers. So in Solution Explorer, under Controllers, I'm going to right-click my Controllers folder. You'll have to do this in your assignment. And I'm going to add a new folder here. So again, it's Controllers, right-click, add new folder, which I will call API. So we're going to build some new controllers in here, but these aren't web controllers, they're API controllers. So they're not going to return any views. There's no front end. So to make our first API controller, I'm going to right click the API folder. I'm going to add a controller. And I'm going to start with this option, an API controller with read, write actions. It will give us rest actions to create, read, update, delete, and list. So this is actually going to create five methods, two get methods, one for getting a list, another one for getting a single record, a put method for update, a post method for create, and a delete method for delete. So pick this option, API controller, with read, write actions and click add. And Visual Studio is going to suggest the name values controller, which is fine. I'm just going to leave that name. This is just kind of for testing purposes. No, we want it, we want to do it right within this project. So this is defined as an API controller. And our root is API slash controller name. So in here, we're going to see here are our two get methods. Our first one, like the other APIs we've already used, like the tippy code one, 
right? If we call API slash values, this is going to call the get method, which will return an array of strings, a list of strings. If we call the same URL, but we add on an integer parameter, it's going to call this version of get instead, the one that takes an ID parameter. And this is just going to return a single value. So we can try this. So we'll go to Postman. But first, I'll just go and grab the base URL of our .NET DUD site. Clear that out. So I'm going to make a new request. Now there's one setting you guys are going to get an error in Postman because we're using HTTPS. So before we execute this request in Postman, click on File and Settings. And this third setting here that says SSL Certificate Verification, by default, that's on. Now we're using a self-signed certificate, so you'll want to turn this off. Otherwise, Postman will complain when we try to call our local host API. So again, in Postman, click on File and Settings and toggle SSL Certificate Verification. Change it from the default of on, change that to off. So now I'm going to call our API slash values. We'll make a GET request with no ID parameter. So when I send that, notice it returns this array of strings with a 200 response. So it's calling this get method with no parameters and it returns value one and value two. If I add an ID to my URL, I should get just a single string back. Do you get a 200 response, Kevin? What's the response, what's the status? Okay, so you may have mistyped the URL. Your, remember, it's got to be the port number for your web application. So it's going to start with 443, but those other two numbers, so just load, go to your home page in the browser. But make sure the port number is correct. Your port number might be different from mine. So now if I add any integer, a slash and an integer at the end, it's now calling my second get method. If I put in a string, now we're getting a 400 error, right? Our API, there is no get method that accepts a string parameter. So this is where we get our bad request. Right, so our syntax in our request is bad. It generates that 400 response. We click preview, it gives us a JSON object. One or more errors occurred, our status is 400. And the error description is the value ABC is not valid. Okay. So in here, we've got a post and it accepts a string called value. We can try that out. There's a put. So notice the, the URL for get and post, it's the same, right? So what determines which method runs is which HTTP method we choose here. 
put also takes an ID parameter, just like this get does. But when we change the method to put, we pass in an ID and a value. And then delete will also pass in an ID. So let's try this. So we're going to try a post. So our URL, our base URL, it's just our API slash values. We're going to submit a post. And the parameter defined here is a string called value. So I'm going to click on body. It says our request doesn't have a body right now. So we can do this a couple different ways. We could use form data. When I put in a key called value, some form value here. And I'll see if I can submit call the post method this way. And we got a unsupported media type, which I don't fully understand. <laughs> um, this form data, we'll try it this way. I'll try form URL encoded. Don't really understand that. Okay, I'll try one more in raw. I'll pass in a JSON object value. See if this works. Because our APIs can accept JSON. Okay, I'm not going to worry about that. that doesn't really make much sense to me. <laughs> Again, it gives us a 400 bad request. It's all right, I'll just leave that out for now. So now we're gonna scaffold a different kind of controller. You don't have to make this one for your assignment. Uh, no, post doesn't require an ID. Put will require an ID, but post doesn't. Curious if we try delete. So we'll go back here for a minute. So if I put in an ID and call delete with no body, right, then we get a 200 response. But if we call delete without an ID, right, we get a not allowed. You can't call delete without an ID because our parameter is required. It's not optional. So this was a simple API controller. We're going to create a new one. And what we're going to do next is all, is all you have to do in your assignment. It'll be a little easier to test. So you're going to go back here. I'm going to right click my API folder and I'm going to add one more controller. This time, instead of a read-write controller, I want an API controller with actions using Entity Framework. So this is going to create five methods, but this time it's going to be connected up to our database. So pick API controller with actions using Entity Framework. It's kind of like this option that we've used before, except there are no views. And I add it. My model, let's pick our cart model. It's going to default to our application DB context and it will give us the name of carts controller. I'll click add. So in your assignment, you have to create one API controller based on one of the models in your project. I don't care which model it is.
So I get a new API controller. The root will be API slash carts. It's got a constructor with dependency injection. Our constructor requires an instance of our database connection. And here are our two get methods with no parameters. This is going to get all the carts with an ID parameter. It's going to look up that single cart and either return 404 not found or the requested cart with a 200 response. Our put method, if our URL parameter is 100, but the ID of the cart is 200, it's going to return 400 bad requests. We're updating the wrong cart. Otherwise, it'll save the changes and return 204, which is a success, but no content returned. Our post takes a new cart object, saves it to the database, and returns a status of 201. New resource was created, and it also will return the new cart object, including the new ID. Delete takes an ID. If we don't have that ID, it returns 404. Otherwise, it'll just return a 200 response after it removes from the database. So we can use Postman to try this out. And this is exactly how I'll test your APIs in the assignment. So I'm going to change my method back to get. And I'm going to change my URL from to API slash carts and I'll send my request. So this is going to use our application DB context. It'll connect to SQL server and it's going to fetch all of the cart objects in the database. I click on pretty, it nests everything nicely. So all the way back from November 11th, all the way down to December 7th. I've got items in my shopping cart. If I want to look at one specific cart record, I can just add a valid ID parameter. And now it fetches just this one. Again, I get a response of 200 success. If I put in an ID number that doesn't exist, Right? I get a 404 not found. So what I want to do now is test post, put, and delete. We don't have to rewrite the code. The scaffolded code should work, but I want to just see how they work. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I'll test it. I'll use my first ID. So I'm going to want to create a new cart object, then I'm going to update it, and then I'm going to delete it. So I'm going to take this first object, I'm going to copy it here. So run a GET request, you can use an ID parameter or no ID parameter, you just want to copy from the results pane, copy one cart object. If you don't have one, I'll put one in the chat you can use anyway. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to change my URL. I'm taking, going to take out the parameter because I want to post a new one. So I'm going to change my method to post. I'm going to click on the body. And then I'm going to choose raw and toggle this little drop down here to say JSON. So we want to pass a JSON object to the post method of our API. I'm going to paste this in, but I need to make want to make a couple changes here. 
I'm going to change the date to today. So I'll say 12 09. And it's 1223. There's also something here I should take out. What should I remove from this object if we're going to run a post method to create a new card object? Right, Lindsay, we want to remove the ID because the ID is going to come from the database. And I'll change my customer to say maybe API tester. So I'll leave the rest of the values. I'll put this JSON object in the chat for you. We can all try the same object. So I want to try to post this. So I'm posting to slash carts. I chose body, raw, and JSON. And then I pasted in the ob this JSON object that I've put in the chat. And now I'm going to click send. Okay, what happened? We got a bad request. Let's see why. Something about my date time. Uh, what did I do wrong? Let's see. We'll call get. Just to reformat the date and time a bit. Why didn't it like my date and time? I'll just change that again. We'll try it again. We'll try to post it. Okay, and notice I get 201, request fulfilled, and a new resource was created. Sorry, I'll put the updated JSON object in the chat. And if I scroll down now, here's my new cart object with ID 69. So if I want to verify that now, I can change my method back to get and put on 69 in the end. And now I can query and fetch that record from the database, 200 OK. So I'm going to copy that whole object and now we're going to try to update it. So I'm going to go back to my body, paste in my full object with my, now that it's got my ID. I'm going to try this a few ways. I want to simulate the different conditions in the API. So first I'm going to change the number here. So what if I put in my ID as 690 my ID is 69, and we're going to update the quantity from 1 to 2. Okay. So here I've got a mismatch. My URL has ID 690, but my JSON object has ID 69. So this should throw some kind of error, because the ID we're passing doesn't match the ID in the request body. I'm going to change my method to put and try and run an update. So when I try this, I get a 400 bad request. It's not exactly a syntax problem. You could, I, I yep, if you want different tabs, that's fine. So in their put, if we look, right, what happens when we call put, we have an ID from the URL, but then we also have a card object. And the first 
line of code in here says if our ID and the ID of the cart of the request object don't match, if they're not the same, we're going to return a bad request. So that's what's happened when I use 690 in the URL, but 69 here. So if I fix my URL to 69 and I change my quantity to two, I should be able to do an update now. So I'll send my put request. I get no content back, but I get a 204 success response. So how do I know if that update actually ran? Well, I can just change my method from put back to get. And when I query this again, it should now show me that quantity is two instead of one. So I'm going to toggle my method from put to get. Send my request. It says 200 OK. And now when we run the query, our quantity has been updated. Now I want to delete this object. I'll change my method to delete. We still have our ID of 69. Send my request. Postman says it's successful. Now, again, I want to check, did the delete actually work? So I can go back to get. What response should we receive this time? If I execute my get request now at cart 69, right, Dan and Lindsay, right? That's good. That's the response we wanted. 404, it's gone. So the scaffolding code, scaffolded code works great. We didn't have to change anything. So this is all you need to do for the assignment. Add an API subfolder, scaffold a controller, an API controller for one of the existing controllers. So you can have two files with the same controller name, one that's in the root, your web controller, and one that's in your API subfolder. It's all you need to do, then commit it to GitHub and you're done. So the last thing we want to do is use Swagger, which is an open source tool that will create API documents for us. Before tools like Swagger came along, we had to spend a lot of time documenting our APIs. I probably have some. So here's a, uh, do I not have it anymore? Ah. Let's see. I could probably find, so here's an API document that this is an API another developer wrote that I had to integrate an ASP.NET site I built. The customers, uh, our customer, they were, they had their customers using two separate applications and they didn't want customers to have to log into them separately. They said, if they can log into my application, we should be able to authenticate them through to this other application. So the other developer created this 14 page API document <laughs> that listed all of the different API endpoints right here. So you do a post to OAuth slash token. You provide all of these values in JSON. And he would send back a response token. So it was really time consuming to create this kind of documentation. Right? Yeah, Stripe created it. We could read it. I might have another example of another one I've done somewhere. I can't think of where it is right now. But it was, anyway, it was time consuming to build this kind of stuff. To, to write the documentation for our API. Yeah, I can't even think of where I've got other ones here. I know I do. So the, yeah, and then as soon as you update the API, you have to go and update the documentation, right? Because the documentation is what other developers rely on. It describes how to do it. So 
Swagger was an answer to this. So there's some links here I put on Blackboard about using Swagger. So I'll show you how this works. We need to add a package, add about five lines of code and we're done. So Swagger and, OPI, and Open API, it's a language agnostic spec for describing REST APIs. It allows both computers and people to understand what capabilities an API has. Okay, so it's designed to reduce work. And there's two different implementations. There's Swashbuckle and NSwag. We're gonna use Swashbuckle. So we're basically just gonna follow what it tells us to do here, which is install a package and add a few lines of code in startup. That's really all we've got to do. And it's going to then build, inspect our API and build a document right into our website for us. It's not even a separate doc. So let's go back to Visual Studio. You don't even need to use Swagger in your assignment. You might on the final exam, but you don't on your assignment. So click on Tools, NuGet Package Manager, Manage, manage NuGet Packages for Solution. Tools, NuGet Package Manager, Manage NuGet Packages. Click on the Browse tab on the left, and you are searching for swashbuckle.aspnet core. I'll even put it in the chat. So search for that. Swagger tools for documenting APIs built on .NET Core. Perfect. 73 million downloads. So click on it. Select the web project. We don't need it in our unit testing project. There's no API there. We need it in the .NET Duds project. And we can just install the latest version, which is 5.6.3. So again, browse, search for swashbuckle.aspnet core, click on it. Choose your web project and install. We'll accept the license. And then we just need a few lines in startup to configure it. We can go back to Solution Explorer and open up our startup file. So we need to add the service in Configure Services, and then we configure the UI in the Configure method. So I'm going to come down to the very bottom of my Configure Services method. So we want to register Swagger Generator for API documentation. So we are just going to call add Swagger Gen, add the Swagger Generator. And this code is right out of the tutorial. I've linked to it on Blackboard, so you have it for reference. So one line of code here, add the Swagger generator. And that goes at the bottom of the configure services method. And then we've got just a couple lines that need to go in configure and then we can try out our docs and then we're done. So down at the bottom of configure, we want to enable Swagger UI and set the endpoint for the API docs. So our app is going to use Swagger. It's also going to use Swagger's UI component. And we just set up some options here.
And we only really need one option, which is our swagger endpoint, which is going to be swagger v1 swagger.json. And we can give it a name. So this will be the title that appears at the top of our documentation. So I'll call it .NET Duds API V1. So you can change this heading and you can change the version numbers, right? We saw the version numbers in, uh, for example, in Spotify's API. Don't worry, I'll put the code back. So on Spotify, right, their API, version one. So that should be it. So I'm gonna save this. I'll build my project. Save the changes and build. So we're using Swagger and using Swagger UI and configuring the endpoint. We can try it out. So now if we just go to our base URL and then just add slash Swagger at the end. It creates an HTML file. So our title shows up here. So if we make multiple versions, it'll archive them. And it finds two API controllers, carts and values. And we can even use Swagger like Postman. So if I want to, I click on get API slash carts. So this method takes no parameters. It returns a 200 success response. It gives us a sample of what a cart response would look like. And we can even try it out. There's a button here, try it out. Go ahead and execute. So this works just like Postman right in the browser. So users can actually try the API right from the Swagger docs. So it gives us the endpoint and actually executes the API method and returns all the data. And it's got the ability to test the other methods as well, post the get ID, put and delete. Pretty neat. So we have not had to write any documentation. We just installed Swashbuckle. for ASP.NET Core, and we configured it, we added it, added the service, and we've enabled it on startup. And it automatically inspects the API. So if we change the API and rebuild our solution, Swagger is gonna update our documentation for us, which is great. Okay, so that is our completed .NET duds. That's as far as we're gonna go until next week when I ask you to do some more during the final exam. So this is lesson 12, API with Swagger Docs. Okay, are there any questions from anybody before we wrap up for today? So you've got time, I would encourage you do assignment two, part three now. Just scaffold the controller, upload it to get API controller, upload it to GitHub, submit on Blackboard. Go ahead and do your quiz. It's based on the lesson we just did while well, this is fresh in your mind. Hey, Rich. Did you say that we needed the Azure, uh, we need to start the service for submitting this one? If your Azure service is running, that's great. Then okay. yes, please do start. If you're like out of credits, don't worry about it. Okay, cool. thanks. And yes, you can use Swagger, but the issue is you have to, you're gonna have to enable Swagger in your project, which is not required. 
Your other option, if Postman doesn't work, is you can use this hopscotch.io in your browser. So that will allow you to test your API. I don't totally know, though, if Hopscotch is going to work for local requests or if it's only live URLs. Never used it. Jillian, can you clarify your question? Okay, thanks, Mike. I'm going to stop the